Well, Father, today we are going to affirm through your word what we already know through what we've witnessed through testimony today and in song, that your desire is to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And Lord, we're going to learn just a bit more about that through the life of Moses as we dive into his epic story today. Lord, we are so grateful for what we've already been learning throughout the course of this year as we heard about things like you are the creator of the universe. Lord, would we glory in that? Would we marvel in it? Would we never forget it? Would we remember the ramifications of the fall and the impact that it's had on each of our lives and the pain and suffering that's in this world? But would we also remember that it was in your plan from the very beginning that you would send a rescuer? That rescuer is none other than Jesus. Thank you for giving us types and shadows of him through the lives of Joseph and through the lives of Abraham and even through the lives of Moses as we study it today. Lord, we can't thank you enough for your miracle working power. Lord, would we learn more about it today as we hear this word, let my people go. And Father, would that be a word for today for those who are here who have loved ones or who themselves find themselves in bondage, that the God of the universe is speaking, let my people go to the devil. The devil has no opportunity. Lord, we ask you to bind up the devil to keep all the ears open, all the eyes open that we could hear and see exactly what you want to do and say in our lives and keep him from the oppression that he wants to bring. Keep him from anything that he tries to do to thwart the word of God from going forward today in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So we are studying in this series that we're calling Epic. We're taking like 50 different major Bible stories throughout the course of the year. And today we land on none other than the story of Moses. I pray that God uses it to inspire us yet again. I hope you're reading the word. I hope you're fired up. I hope you're excited. I hope God's already speaking to you if you're diving in. If you're not, jump in. Don't wait. Go ahead and dive right in. Read the book of Exodus along with us this month. Next week, we're going to be talking about the parting of the Red Sea. So go ahead and dive into that story. Read it before you come here. That way when you come, God does something to ignite what you've already been reading and learning and just reinforcing it in our lives. Because I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes I got to hear stuff two or three times before it starts to think, sink in through this thick skull. And nobody else here has those kinds of issues. Lord, help me, help me so that we could learn together. So this story really picks up a little bit where the story of Joseph falls off when we look at Exodus chapter 1 verse 7 it really ties the two stories together if you weren't here last week be sure to go on our app or our website download that last message watch it share it God will continue to use it so Exodus 1 7 is where we're gonna pick up today it says but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them so we enter into this story with God's people thriving, God's people prospering, God's moving in their midst. And we see this story repeated historically time and time again as a people group, but also as individuals in our own life. I wanna personalize this at the same time that we look at this greater story that God's doing. So what happens is one of two things seems to happen in our lives individually or corporately as a movement, be it Christianity, or Judaism as they're talking about in this particular story. But what happens is when things are going good, when things are multiplying, when God's people are doing good, either we short circuited ourselves or the devil wants to get in there and stop the move of God from happening. So what do I mean? The devil is intent to kill, steal, and destroy. Did we not even see that in what happened this very week in Florida? The devil's intent is to steal, kill, and destroy. You have to realize that if you're a believer. The devil wants to take you out. We'll hear it in today's story. If you don't believe me, hear what he wanted to do to the Jewish people and just say, that's what he wants to do to you too. So we have to be on guard. We have to be ready. We have to be prepared. We have to understand that our enemy is real and that he wants to take us out. But God is real too and he loves us and he wants us to thrive and he wants us to advance. He wants us to prosper. So sometimes the devil wants to get in there and stop the move of God that's happening. Other times a big theme that you see in scripture is when we start to prosper and we start to do good, we start to internalize it and we become sinful and we think we're the ones that got us to that place of prosperity. Has that ever happened to anybody here for honest? You don't need to raise any hands. You can. Amen. Someone brave enough to, right? 
We think that we got it all together, and what happens is even in America today, if you bring us to this place that we're at, in times of prosperity, the gospel doesn't seem to advance all that much. We think that we've got it down, and then what happens oftentimes is God allows a season of judgment to occur because of our own sinfulness to bring us back to a place of repentance. So which one of these is at play in this particular story? I think it's really the first one that I shared. I think that the devil is attempting to stop the move of God, and he's trying to enslave and put the people of God into a state of physical and mental and spiritual and emotional bondage. He's trying to kill them. He's trying to destroy their spirit. He doesn't want them to advance. He's doing the same thing in our generation. He doesn't have any new bag of tricks. Look at what's in scripture. He repeats the same stuff over and over again. We know what he's going to do. We can have a ready defense, as you'll see here in scripture and through scripture today. So the story goes on. It it picks up if you go into Exodus 1.8. It said, now there arose a new king over Egypt, one who did not know Joseph. So it's sometime after the story of Joseph that we read about last week. Joseph's gone. The Pharaoh that was in charge at that time is gone. And he says to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. You're going to see the same thing if you read the New Testament with King Herod, are you not? right? He wants to take out Jesus. He hears that a new king is going to arise. So in the natural, kings want to protect their kingdoms, even when they're satanically inspired, or especially when they're satanically inspired. They want to be the one. They want to be the one that's worshiped. In a smaller sense, we do it ourselves too. We want the world to revolve around us. It's me, myself, and I, my preferences, my wants, my needs, my desires, That's partially why God gives us marriage so we can begin to break that and focus on the needs of others because in our sinfulness, we are so self-centered. None of y'all are self-centered, are you? I told you before, I'm an only child. I got issues, you know? So, I mean, we all have issues, but we need to break those down, right? So there's a natural component to this. There's a supernatural component to this. But the devil is putting his plan in place to attempt to thwart the advancement of the kingdom of God. I can't make this point enough. When you want to prosper, when you want to advance, be ready for opposition. It's going to happen. The devil's going to try to stop what you're doing and discourage you from advancing in the kingdom of God and growing up to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. But God will get the victory. Know that you have God actually praying for you, it says in Scripture. Exodus 1.12. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. They made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field and all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So they wanted to enslave them. This story of Egypt is always one of bondage and breaking of bondage by the power of the Holy Spirit. The bondage was broken because God comes in and intervenes when the people of God begin to cry out and say enough is enough. So the devil wants to keep them down. Doesn't it seem in life, as I shared earlier, when things tend to be going good, don't we tend to slip from our relationship with God? What kind of protections might we put in there where we would remember like when things are going good, it's God who brought us to this place of goodness. Lord, would we not forget? Would we not fall back into these same patterns? Would we remember where our source comes from, right? Oppression yet expansion, how is that possible? Diamonds are made from great pressure, are they not, right? Look back at Joseph from last week. He's thrown into a pit, he's sold as a slave, he's falsely accused of rape, he's thrown into jail, he almost gets out, he has to wait two more years. And then God finally puts him by Pharaoh's side where he comes to that position and place of influence. Would he have ever got to that place with the wisdom that he had without going through the pressure cooker? Probably not, right? 
So maybe look at some of the challenges and pressures you're facing in life as God allowing a test to occur in you to refine you and mold you and make you into the person that he wants you to be. If things are going good and easy all the time, we don't tend to press in. I guarantee you, Jack did a lot of pressing in when he got that, you know, that, that thing from the doctor that said, guess what, you've got cancer, right? Why do we wait, not in his case, but why do we all have this tendency in our own sinfulness to wait till we get that doctor's note, so to speak, before we allow real change to happen in our lives? Why do we wait for the husband and wife, like we get calls all the time where they come to us and they're like, my marriage is in a shambles, they're gonna leave me today. Your marriage started to be in a shambles probably six months ago. Why didn't you call us six months ago? My finances are in a shambles. Oh my God, they're gonna take my house, they're gonna do it. You knew you were having problems with your finances six months ago. Why didn't you come to us before you needed a miracle, right? Don't go on wallowing in these things. Don't go on holding, don't go on waiting, don't go on enslaved and in bondage when God wants to set you free. God wants to set you free. Don't find yourself trapped in that place for too long. Get help, raise the white flag early. Can I get an amen, right? See, our faith seems to grow under pressure. Sadly enough, self-reliance is the opposite of God-reliance, and we need to begin to rely more on God than on our own selves. The parallels to today are astounding. All the more proof that what we believe is true. In places where Christianity is suppressed, guess what? It is thriving. It may not look like this where you got big buildings and you've got all kinds of bells and whistles, but let me tell you, in places where Christianity is being pressure tested, it is growing, and guess what? God's probably going to allow pressure testing in our generation right now too. There's some trends that are happening in the church today. We're trying to discern them. We're trying to figure them out. We're trying to think them through because things are changing very fast in culture and society today. Do you know that about the same number of people call themselves members of Journey as they did a year or two ago? But look at how many empty seats are around you right now. People are putting less of an emphasis on God than they used to in previous generations. So rather than coming to church every single week like I did when I got saved, Man, I grew so much. You know how many times I've been in church, not just preaching and teaching, but from the time I was 22 years old, I didn't miss a church service unless I was sick like Mary Jo is today. Y'all can pray for her. She got that flu. Come on, Jesus. She got the cooties. Come on. But in our generation, it's like, nah, I'll stay home. I'll chill out. All you people in your diapers and your underwear on stage, whatever, you know, I mean, like, come on. Get your butt offline and get into church somewhere where you're supposed to be. Don't be staying there. If you're really legitimately sick, amen. You know, if you're sick, please use it. That's what it's for. But there's something that you can't get unless you're in the fellowship with other believers. But people are putting less of an emphasis on that today. It's the strangest thing that I've ever seen. Why? Because maybe Christianity isn't being pressure tested right now. But maybe we're starting to get glimpses of it. There was a time I preached a message and... I talked about some of the tactics that the devil used through Nazi Germany, through used through Hitler. One of the things that they started to do is first they started to poke fun at the Jewish people. And then after they started to poke fun at the Jewish people, they started to turn them into subhumans. They began to think of them as something that was not human because ultimately they wanted to call them cockroaches because cockroaches needed to be exterminated, right? Aren't you starting to see that on the world stage today? Think about guys like Mike uh, uh, Pence, our vice president, right? This week, Joy Behart came out and said, oh, if someone talks to Jesus, that might be okay, but if Jesus talked back to them, that means they're crazy, right? So now all of a sudden, we as Christians are crazy. Or what do they talk about Tim Tebow? They were doing some of the same things to him. So all of a sudden, society and television is starting to say that you and I are the crazy ones and they are the right ones. What do you think their setup is? These are the early stages of what we're starting to see in societal change that ultimately leads to this place in Egypt where the Pharaoh, where the king declares that you and I need to be enslaved because we're crazy because we believe in this man named Jesus. And then, let me tell you something, churches aren't gonna look like they look like today. But guess what? They're gonna be more Christians practicing Christianity, but it won't be in buildings like this. They'll be scattered all around the place seeking Jesus. Why don't we seek him now? 
while times are good and remember the goodness of our God like you're doing today. See, the things that need to be preached are often the ones that are not in the seats. Come on, Jesus, right? May they watch it later. Come on, Lord. I went far from my notes today. Come on. <laughs> but you think... I'm going to be in trouble for that one. So where Christianity is suppressed, it thrives. So again, what happens? Pharaoh ends up issuing a horrific edict to kill all the young male Hebrew children. It ends up happening yet again at the time Jesus is about to be born. His desire is to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to rob you. He wants to rob your marriage. He wants to rob you of life. And ultimately, he wants to kill you and enslave you. That is his job. Enter chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that she was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of, of bulrushes and dowed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in and placed him among the reeds in the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. So much like Abraham did with Isaac, right? This woman is absolutely desperate. The children are all being killed and she wants her child to survive. She's willing to take the very risk of putting the thing that she deems most precious into the river and say, God, I lay that in your hands. I tell you that is not only for children. What idols are you holding on to today? What things are you holding on to that you need to let go and let God into and let him do his thing? The thing that only he could do. There's some things that you might need to release today that you need to put in a little boat and you need to let out there to see and say, God, will you intervene? God, will you do the changing? And I'm praying that some of you will do that today. So she lets him go. Some of you are crying out for your babies, whether an adult child or not. You're believing for them. You're saying, God, will they come home? God, will you change them? God, will you deliver them? God, will you set them free? I got emails even this very morning. Heck, for my own son. I think many of us are in that same boat. We're praying, we're interceding. We're hoping for the best, but it doesn't seem to come because the devil's trying to enslave them. The devil's trying to keep them from their God-given purpose and plans. I'm here to tell you, keep praying, keep crying out, keep interceding because you're gonna see how the Israelites got the victory and then how we will too. Let's read on just a little more, Exodus 2, 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and while the young woman walked beside her, she saw a basket among the reeds and sent a servant woman, and she took it, and when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse for the child? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and the nurse with me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter and she became her son or he became her son. She named him Moses or in Hebrew Moishi because she said, I drew him out of the water. What a miracle again that you're seeing here. Right? Think of Joseph that we talked about last week and how he ends up in jail and he ends up in all these situations just so he could be positioned right next to Pharaoh. What happens in this story? Not only is God so good that when she pushes that baby down the river, who ends up finding it only by divine appointment? It's Pharaoh's daughter, right? And then not only that, when she goes looking for a wet nurse, someone to nurse that baby, it's his very own mama, so she gets her baby back. How good is our God? He can orchestrate these kinds of things in your life too. Would we trust in him? See, under the most desperate of odds, when no human power will suffice, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. This is the amazing God that we serve. May we never, ever, ever forget that. As the story goes on, Moses is grown up, and in 2.11 it says, One day when Moses grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. So something inside of him sees injustice, and he's willing to step up. He's willing to make a difference. He's willing to go out and, and, in this case, actually act in a bad way. And he kills the guy, right? 
not a good thing, right? That's not what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to pray, we're supposed to intercede, we're supposed to intervene, but God is doing something and it's hard. And another thing you might see here is no matter how gross your failures, when you repent, God can use you. There's nothing that you can ever do to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No matter how gross you think your sin is, no matter how far you think you've strayed from him, if you will say, God, will you forgive me? I love you. I am sorry. I want to serve you from this day forward. He will forgive you, and he will use you in the mighty and glorious name about Jesus, of Jesus. This next passage is not so much about Moses. I think it's about what God's heart is for his people. Exodus 2, 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God knew. Would we stop complaining and we start crying out? personally and nationally when we see crazy stuff out there, right? When we complain about society continuing to degrade and this going on and that going on, would we start groaning? Guys, we need to start getting desperate for God. Desperate for the creator of the universe. Our lives need to revolve around this thing called Christianity and this man named Jesus. He needs to be first and foremost in our life. If, I'm, if the things I'm saying are true and the devil really wants to take us out, if you think our five minute a day prayer life where we say, Jesus, would you bless this food in the mighty name of Jesus and make it not go to my hips in Jesus' name <laughs> is gonna help you while you're eating fried chicken, come on, Lord. We need to get down and dirty and into the weeds. That's the season that we're in because I'm telling you, this season of grace that we've been experiencing is one day going to come to an end and it might happen faster than any of us can imagine with some of the world events that we see on the timeline right now. Let's not wait until that moment of desperation would we begin to cry out now for our families. Would we begin to cry out for our city? Would we begin to cry out for our nation? Would we not wait but would we do it now? The time is now because God is listening and he knows. My last verse for today, Exodus 3, 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land that is good and broad land and into a land flowing with milk and honey. That's God's desire for you. It may not be a physical place, but a place of peace and wholeness and spirit, soul and body. A place of freedom, a place of opportunity, a place where we love the Lord our God with all our heart, strength, soul and mind. And we're free from the bondages of this life. But we got to pray, we got to intercede because here's what happens if you know the story. Um, you know, Moses doesn't just walk up to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and it immediately happens. Do you remember that? See, I have a saying. You might have heard me say it before. Strongholds are strongholds for a reason. Those things that are keeping you from giving God your all in the air of your finances are a stronghold in your life. Those things that are keeping you from serving God with everything that's within you, those sins that you want to cling to and hold on to, or maybe you don't want to cling to and hold on to, but you've had trouble getting past them, those are strongholds. They don't come down easily. Moses had to say to Pharaoh a number of times, seven I think, right? Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. You got to cry out 70 times, seven times if you need to. Lord, free me from the bondage of sin and death. Free my loved ones from the bondage of sin and death. Lord, would you intercede? Would you move? Keep crying out because the victory is assured. When you read on, guess what? After that last let my people go, after the Passover, and we're going to talk about the Passover during our Easter services. It coincides perfectly with the timing of that. He passes over. The angel of death passes over. They finally let them go. The people end up leaving. You know how good God is? 
all the wages that they were suppressed in, every bit that they were put into bondage and slavery and made to work, it says they actually even left with the plunder of the Egyptians. How amazing is that? They just handed it over, like, get up out of here. Here's some gold, here's some silver, go, leave. God will take care of you. He loves you that much. He loves you that much. I pray you believe that today. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? <laughs> Hebrews 4.10 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet is without sin. Father, as we've heard this story of Moses today, even in those moments where I digressed, I pray your word showed through. I pray that your spirit showed through where you knew the cries of our hearts. Lord, would we be quick to cry out and not hold on to those things that enslave us and ensnare us? Would they not become friends that we're comfortable with? Would we not be stricken with a syndrome where that becomes normal to us, Lord God? Father, would we be a passionate people who are sold out to live for you with everything that's within us? Would we not fear that in the advancement of the kingdom of God in our lives or in our people as Christians, would we not fear the devil's coming attacks, Lord God, because the weapons of our warfare are not natural in nature, but they are supernatural to the pulling down of strongholds in Jesus' name. So I ask you right now to pull down the strongholds that might be enslaving the people of Journey Church. We come against them and we knock them down in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, the King of Kings, the only name that really matters, that name that is above every other name, that name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I pray that we do it willingly in this life while things are good and don't have to do it unwillingly one day when we reach that judgment day when you, when you come to us and say, who, who is my son and what do you believe in him? And we would all just declare together that Jesus truly is the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again. And Lord, would you be the savior of my life? See, that's the starting point. Maybe you're here today and you've never made that declaration. I pray that you would do just that today, that you would surrender your life to Jesus. For others of you, you are believers, but maybe you've been kind of walking a little bit of a different direction, and you just know that today's the day you need to come home. Today's the day that you need to put him first. From this moment forward, you want to walk in might and power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I promise I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to join hands with you and pray with you. So if today's the day where you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, here's what I'd ask. Would you raise your hand up real high while nobody else is looking right now? Is that you today? Is there anyone here today that needs to surrender their life to God? I see your hand, sir, and your hand, sir. Thank you, Lord, and your hand in the back. Hey, here's what I'd ask you to do. I promise I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want to pray with you. If you raised your hand, would you come right here to the front? I'd love to pray with you and intercede with you. Everybody around you will clap for you. I saw a hand in the back right there. Our men, come on, welcome home, welcome home, baby, welcome home. Welcome home. God bless you. So glad you're here. Lord, I join with these men today and we are fired up for them, Lord God, the spirit of the living God and the anointing thereof. May it be upon them and rest upon them in mighty and powerful ways, Lord. Father, would you just bless these men as they say today, whether for the first time or as a means of rededication that Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again. We all affirm that in them and in our own lives. And we declare today that Lord, from this moment forward, we will serve you, we will live for you. We ask you to protect us and guide us and direct us. Forgive us for those moments that we might have strayed and tried to do things on our own and in our own power, Lord God. Would we just repent of that right now in the name of Jesus? Would we take you at your word? Would we trust you in your word? Father, would we lay aside every weight of burden and sin that so easily entangles? Would we lay it by the wayside? Would we lay it at your feet at the foot of the cross this very morning? Would we walk out of here in freedom and might and power and and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Give them one more big round of applause. God bless you guys. Keep coming back. You're making a difference. Bring somebody with you. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week.